Good evening, everybody, and welcome. We are so happy that you've been able to join us for our symposium, Illustration, Puppetry, and American Popular Culture, which is an online symposium of the art and legacy of Tony Sarg. And this uh, program, both uh, this evening and tomorrow, is a collaboration of the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies, of the Norman Rockwell Museum, and the American Theater for Puppetry Arts in Austerlitz, New York. The program brings together artists, puppeteers, designers, and scholars to explore the life and art and work of Tony Sarg, um, who, of course, as you may know, is a charismatic illustrator, puppeteer, and entrepreneur whose prolific career sheds light on the creative imagination and the ability of artists to inspire a collective sense of wonder and joy. Thank you for joining us for this interactive virtual tour of our exhibition, which is Tony Sarg, Genius at Play, which will remain on view here at the Norman Rappel Museum through Sunday, November 5th. So if you haven't gotten to see it and you feel you can make it, we'd certainly love to have you in person, but we're glad you're here now. I'm Stephanie Habush -Plunk Plunkett, Deputy, Deputy Director and Chief Curator at the Norman Rappel Museum. And I'm very pleased to introduce you to my co-curator, Lenore D. Miller who it has been a great pleasure and honor to work with. Uh, Lenore is Curator Emerita at the George Washington University Museum. And thrilled to introduce you to Darren E. Johnson, who is the founding CEO and Artistic Director of the American Theater for Puppetry Arts, um, and who is also a catalog essayist and a lender to the exhibition, uh, and who's provided great inspiration throughout the process. I'd also like to, to uh, just to give a great shout out to our partners at the Nantucket Historical Association uh, for their partnership in organizing this exhibition and to the many lenders who have made this most comprehensive exhibition of Tony Sarg's work possible. I'll just mention that tomorrow, a series of virtual talks and panel discussions are going to shed light on the many aspects of Sarg's career from his work as an illustrator and champion of puppetry uh, to his founding designs for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and of course his legendary uh, time on Nantucket. Sarg's legacy will be explored by contemporary artists and performers who will also uh, have made their own mark by combining artistry and skill with showmanship and canny innovation uh, to explore new and inventive ways to engage with the public. We look forward to uh, taking this gallery walk with you. And I'd like to thank actually my colleagues, Rich Bradway and Ellen Gorman, who are behind the scenes and who are making this uh, recording possible. And I just say, we're really happy to have your questions and comments. So I hope that as you're listening to our comments, you'll be placing your own into the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. And we will be making stops along the way to um, uh, answer and uh, or try to respond uh, to your queries. So we'll look forward to those. So I'm just gonna start with one question that seems to come up quite a bit. And that is, where did the idea for this exhibition come from? And that sort of pertains to all of our shows. And the answer is really varied. Sometimes it comes internally from staff who might have a passion about one subject or another. Uh, oftentimes it comes from suggestions from people we speak to, uh, members of our public. But in this case, it actually started with a handkerchief. So um, I'm gonna let Lenore um, explain how an exhibit started with a handkerchief. Thank you, Stephanie, and I'm honored and thrilled to be with you this evening. And thank you again to all the staff for their great support. So it was about 10 years ago at this point that I uh, frequented a flea market in the area where I live in near Washington, DC. And I was cruising a textile display, uh, things were being were for sale. And I found these two wonderful little handkerchiefs. And if you notice on the lower right corner, it says a name, Tony Sarg. 
And that completely intrigued me when I got them home. I didn't notice it at first. I got them home. I said, I want to find out who, who is Tony Sarr. And that was sort of the beginning of this odyssey for me of research and fun. <laughs> now I've lost temperature. So I believe Tony Sarg said at some point that his best actors were his animals. And I think that his humorous take on animals, you know, circus type the characters and dogs and other creatures really portray his sense of humor and fun that he enjoyed in his life. So then I was thinking about this and then I knew Stephanie uh, because we were colleagues at George Washington University's uh, museum because I invited Stephanie to look at a painting that we had of Norman Rockwell. And I found that uh, she was so uh, accessible and knowledgeable that we became friendly. And uh, I proposed the idea of doing further research and working on Tony Sard as a creative uh, individual in the most in ingenious way we could come up with. And it blossomed from there. Great. Thank you so Thank much, you. Lenore. So we are going to take you on a swing through this gallery, and we'll begin with a little bit of background on Tony Sarg's life. So Ellen is going to walk you through uh, to get a great view, and um, we'll start in this section of the exhibition. I'll just mention that there are almost 200 works uh, on view here at the museum, uh, both original paintings and drawings, as well as sketchbooks and photographs and uh, lots of other memorabilia. But um, starting here on this wall, and I'm going to um, let Ellen bring you closer, we have some wonderful examples of Tony Sarg's very early work. Uh, Sarg was actually born in Coban, Guatemala, uh, and that is actually a place where his father was a uh, diplomat representing the, the German government, and his mother was of English descent. He essentially grew up on a coffee plantation because there were uh, German citizens who owned coffee plantations in that part of the world at the time, um, essentially prior to World War II. And Sarg was really untrained, but loved to draw. And I'm just gonna point out these two drawings that Ellen is focusing on right now, uh, created when Sarg was just about eight years old. So he was said to have always a pencil in his hand. Um, you know, you're seeing a scene of a woman seated at a table, very detailed objects on the table. And on the bottom, there are sketches of all kinds of animals uh, that are very animated, uh, as well as a kind of a classical figure. And humorously, Sarg signed his name as Antonio uh, Frederico Sarg. So I think he was being uh, having a little fun with that, even as a boy. But in Sarg's family, there was a rather remarkable artist, and her name was Mary Ellen Best. She was a Victorian painter who was most active in the 1830s. Uh, and she was um, on the paternal side of Sark's family. Uh, and you can see here, there's a reproduction of one of the images that she painted, a very detailed family scene uh, that really gives a great historical record of what uh, affluent homes look like during the period, but one very special object that we have is right above that. Uh, and that is a painting that Mary Ellen Best did of Tony Sarg's father, Francis, when he was probably less than two years old. Um, this is actually on loan to us, and you get a sense of where things come from, uh, from Tim Turpin, who is a great nephew of Tony Sarg and who lives in Australia. Uh, so he had this very special object that he was able to share with the museum. When Sarg was about seven, his family moved back to Germany, and Sarg was enrolled in military academies. 
So um, he began to, uh, even though he did not have training, continue to draw and paint. And at the age of 17, he actually achieved uh, officer status in the German army. But he really did not have the feeling for wanting to continue in that field. And um, I'll just show you here some of the beautiful landscapes that he was painting when he was about 20 years old. Um, these are really observational scenes that you know are very nuanced. Uh, that he created of his own volition. The one on the top is um, actually very special because Tim Turpin, who I um, just mentioned as uh, being a Sarg relative, uh, has actually made a donation of that painting to the Norman Rockwell Museum. So that does come down directly from Sarg to his aunt and then uh, from the donor to us. So that's really a wonderful thing. And this series, uh, represents the German landscape. There's another great early piece here, um, and it just gives you a sense of Sarg's love of storytelling because here uh, in a piece that was done in about 1902, Sarg has written a letter um, essentially to a friend, but what the uh, illustration shows is that a postman has just delivered a letter to a soldier and the postman is walking away in this piece. So Sarg had this, I think, just a great love of storytelling. Um, one of the things that inspired Sarg in terms of his uh, grandmother, Mary Ellen Best, was Best's collection of toys and marionettes and miniature houses, uh, which Sarg really grew up around. And, um, in fact, when uh, Mary Ellen Best passed away, he was the inheritor of those materials. And as Darren begins to talk about uh, Sarg's love of puppetry in the other galleries, you will certainly see uh, that influence. But Lenore is actually going to show a very special piece right now um, that was in Sarg's own collection. Thank you, Thank you Stephanie. In the uh, vitrine that we have here, we have two objects, but I'm going to talk about the first, the, the small figure in, in, on the left, which is called, uh, the name of the ca character is Bradamante. And we think it's maybe dated to around 1900, but it relates to the Sicilian uh, marionette theater that uh, it was ex is extremely important in the history of puppetry and especially with immigrant families in the United States. So one of the places where uh, th th this uh, Sicilian puppetry was shown was the Man uh, Manteo family in uh, lower Manhattan, near, in, actually in Greenwich Village area. And because of that, we, f we find that this particular work is was in the collection of the, the uh, Nantucket Historical Association. And you can see that it's a small scale, but the actual puppets uh, for the Sicilian puppetry uh, theater are really almost life-size puppets. And this is a, a story, again, adapted from Orlando Furioso. And we have a it's it's one it's a wonderful story. It's kind of sad, but at the same time, uh, the the character of Radamante was a heroic uh, figure, uh, perhaps similar in a way to uh, Joan of Arc in history. And then the uh, small book to the right called Soldier Boy is really uh, interesting because it talks of a young man's life uh, uh, in the, in the so, uh, military. And it, I think it reflects a lot of the personality that uh, Tony Sarg was attempting to actually move away from and become more of an artist. But the, uh, the Soldier Boy inspires much of his uh, illustration in this particular way. Thank you. Thanks, Lenora. Yep. Okay. So we are just going to move over here because um, I'd like to share with you uh, a few images that Sarg did also at an early age when he was about, uh, I'd say, 20 to 22 years old. 
Uh, again, he was a soldier with the German army and was really thinking about uh, taking on a career as a professional artist. And this was not necessarily something at all that his father supported at the time. But what you can see in what Ellen is showing you right now is uh, his love of observation, of detail, of portraying uh, figures. He was very interested in observing people. And uh, this is something that continued throughout his career. So at the age of 25, uh, he did make uh, a rather stark decision. And that was uh, to pursue a career as an illustrator, but not necessarily in Germany. He felt that he would have greater success in England. And Darren is gonna share a little background on that. Great, thanks, Stephanie. So in 1905, uh, Tony Sarg decided to leave Germany and pursue his career as a professional illustrator. And when he arrived in London, um, the first thing he did was to try to find a place where he could put hang his hat and have a studio. And so he um, wandered around the London streets and came upon an area which was at that time called uh, Lincoln's Infield. And uh, just a few snippets that I want to share about the history of this building. The building was actually um, built in uh, 1567 and believed to have once been a uh, dairy on a neighboring estate of a Duchess of Portsmouth, a mistress of King Charles II. Um, but the building, so when Tony Sarg came upon this building, it was for rent. And... Um, on the side of the building, it said the curiosity shop inspired by Charles Dickens. And another side note, it wasn't until the 1870s um, that the um, renters of the building uh, had a bookshop and they were the ones that decided to kind of claim that this um, building was associated with Dickens 1841 uh, novel by the same name. Uh, so uh, uh, Sarg moved in there. He actually, on the second floor here, he split the um, second floor into two rooms. And one room was his studio, um, and the other was just uh, vacant for a while. And then he rented the bottom floor uh, to an antique store. Um, I was actually in London uh, last December, and the first thing I wanted to do is see this building. And I uh, went over to the uh, area and it was covered in scaffolding. And I was quite concerned that the building was actually gonna be taken down. Um, but what I learned is, is that Lincoln's infield is now the campus of the London School of Economics. And they had decided to historically renovate the building and they just completed that work. And this is what the curiosity shop now looks like. And so we're spending a lot of time talking about the Curiosity Shop because there's three important things that happen there that are critical to Tony Sarg's story. So the first is, is when Tony Sarg was up here illustrating, he could see out his window and there were throngs of tourists always coming by to see this famous Dickens building. And he got an idea. He thought, why don't I take that empty room on the second floor and create, replicate little Nell's bedroom as it was described in the novel. So he did that and started charging admission. And within the first year, he had raised five times the amount that he was paying in rent. And so what's important about this is Tony Sarg, this was the first time that he realized that he could take his creative ideas and turn them into revenue and profit. The second reason the Curiosity Shop is important is while he was in London, he saw that other artists and illustrators were hosting salons. And so he wanted to replicate that, to bring prospective uh, business partners and colleagues to his, um, to his studio. But he wanted to do something different. And so he thought about that toy collection and the marionettes in that collection that Lenore and Stephanie talked about and decided that he wanted to perform with marionettes as part of his salons. So tomorrow as part of our panel discussion, we're gonna talk about kind of the adventure that he went on to figure out how to build and perform marionettes. But at the Curiosity Shop, this is the first place that Tony Sarg ever performed a marionette. Um, so that's the second reason it's important. 
And the third reason is it's also where he built and designed his first marionette. And in the Nantucket Historical Association's collection, which we have the original and the wall in the other gallery, is a drawing that Tony made of himself with his very first marionette that he created that he named George. And what's also important about that building is that Tony Sarg is credited with inventing the airplane controller that are used on marionettes uh, still today. And I'll have uh, Stephanie hold this. Uh, let me preface, I'm not a puppeteer, um, but this is an airplane controller. As you can see, it looks like an airplane from above. And Sarg's original controller held 24 strings. And as you can see, the front bar comes off and can operate the legs and to allow the marionette to walk. And then different strings control different parts of the marionette. So very important place um, that really launched so many aspects of Tony Sarg's career. Stephanie? Great. Thank you so much, Darren. So uh, in London, uh, Sarg had a wonderful professional career. He began to work for The Sketch, which was a magazine or, or periodical that was um, inspired by celebrity and theater uh, and all of the activity in London. But he was also hired to do a number of important advertisements and projects which with ma major uh, institutions, such as uh, the London uh, Underground, the Tube. So the beautiful series of illustrations that you see here uh, were actually created uh, both as posters and to appear um, in, in a calendar uh, that advertised uh, the company. And uh, what you'll notice is that they're really focused on celebrating the wonderful aspects of life in London. Um, here in this image um, that Ellen is sharing with you right now uh, focuses on, on the theater district in London. And uh, actually like all of the images here, he uses a bird's eye perspective because what Sarg basically said was that um, you know, if he were to show, let's just say the soccer game or football game, as it would be called there, uh, you would really get a very flattened perspective. But here he can actually show so much more. He can show uh, the photographers down in the lower corner trying to get a great shot, uh, even though they have such long shutter, shutter times. You can see uh, the referees waving their arms and the players uh, colliding with one another. And you can even see the reactions of the fans in the stands. So all of this activity, um, kind of human interaction was what Sarg really wanted to show. Um, another piece in the series uh, was actually uh, an image of the Royal Academy uh, that portrayed um, you know, the wonderful art museum where uh, you can see people here discussing the art and um, maybe just having a social moment. Um, but, you know, he's focused on things like costume and expression and, um, you know, different um, physical types that he felt really made um, his art exciting and interesting. Down at the bottom here, there's a great scene of the seashore where uh, you see photographers taking photographs of children and uh, people under their shade umbrellas. Uh, and he's always thinking about color that moves your eye throughout the picture. So where do I place the reds? Where do I place the blues in such a way where essentially your eye will continue to move and take everything in? So, uh, you know, even at that time in London, he uh, had quite a number of high profile projects. But um, as World War I ensued, uh, and with uh, anti-German sentiment becoming more prominent there, uh, Sarg made the decision to actually move to America to come to New York. And uh, he had a wonderful experience actually moving here because uh, he came to New York in uh, 1915. Actually, at that time, he was a very mature artist. He was 35 years old. Uh, he was married and um, 
actually had a daughter, young daughter, Mary. And uh, when he came to New York, he very quickly got an assignment to illustrate for the Saturday Evening Post, which actually Norman Rockwell called the greatest show window in America for an illustrator. So this piece, um, which was published on October 2nd, 1915, shows this you know, wonderful, lively boy losing his hat and riding um, at great strides on a donkey. This was very typical of the kind of subject matter that was popular at the time, the antics of children, which um, as many of you may know, Rockwell also pursued. And uh, But unlike Rockwell, who did 323 Saturday Evening Post covers uh, throughout a 47-year career, Sarg actually did three, and you're seeing them all here. Uh, so, uh, you know, you see one that was a Thanksgiving cover uh, in November of 1915, and then uh, another from 1916 uh, in January, which shows... Um, uh, a snowman uh, being decorated by some boys and, and an onlooker who looks a little bit like Sarg himself. Uh, Sarg really preferred to do linear um, humorous drawings. That was really his forte, though he did um, actually create uh, art for the American boy and for magazines like Family Circle and um, the National Sunday Magazine. And of course, these are many publications that Rockwell also worked for. Um, Rockwell's first post cover was actually in 1916. So even though Rockwell was about 14 years Sargs Jr., they were definitely contemporaries. So Lenore is gonna take a look at a very famous book that Sarg produced uh, to celebrate New York City. Thank you, Stephanie. So T Tony Sarg's New York was one of the major themes of our uh, create of our exhibition. And one of the, the uh, things that he wrote is, it is it is so that I see New York and that I wish to picture it, a city depicted in terms of people. So those were his words, 19, even in 1906. So I would like to just point out the series that he did, which is some, somewhat parallel to the uh, uh, calendar series for the uh, London Underground, but in a, a smaller uh, format for a book called Tony Sarg's New York, and it is available actually today in a reprint called Up and Down New York. And I just wanted to point out a couple of features. And the parallel that I'd like to draw is that the bird's eye view is a device that artists uh, used a lot in the turn of the century. I mean, think of Toulouse-Lautrec and other artists, but it ultimately derives from the perspective of Japanese art that was extremely uh, influential in the 19th century. And if we uh, look at uh, this particular work on the bottom, it shows both Chinatown and uh, the, the Lower East Side where Chinatown and uh, Little Italy come together in uh, New York City. And if, if you notice again that just as Stephanie said, the characterization, you can get a lot more of an activity and scene when you do a, uh, from a bird's eye view, rather than uh, if you try to pre uh, present a perspective that would be sort of normal or uh, in, in a vista. So um, one of my favorites that he did, we, have, we will be referring to this later as well, is the Peacock Alley at the Waldorf Astoria hotel in New York, and uh, off of the Waldorf Astoria uh, Peacock Alley, there were uh, numerous, uh, well, at least two uh, designs that he did, uh, murals on the walls of the Oasis Cafe and the Jungle Bar. And if you look at the upper work on the upper corner here, 
we see, and it's very hard to see, I'm sure, but it, the detail is incredible and it shows Grand Central Station in, in New York. And it, it's sort of the frenzy of, to, of people rushing for trains, centering on the, um, the space that gives you a sense of a large expanse of space. And one of the things that we will uh, mention is that he did uh, work for the a mural of the painted of the cosmos in a theater that existed in in New York uh, at the Grand Central Station for commuters and the, there is a remnant of the lunette that he designed in a place called Central Cellars near Track 17 and we enjoyed seeing that a lot <laughs> thank you Great. And as uh, Stephanie mentioned, um, Sarg moved to New York in 1915, and place was an important thing for Sarg. So Curiosity Shop, you saw lots of place here. His first studio um, was in the Flatiron Building um, overlooking Madison Square Park in Manhattan, which gave him that bird's eye view of New York City, right? Um, and so one of the things that Tony Sarg did when he was at the Flatiron Building was reintroduce his salons with his marionette performances. Um, so he became very popular with the cultural elite in New York City. Um, and so he did one of his performances was a night in Delhi. Um, it featured two Hindu uh, snake charmers as well as a dancing cobra. But the new uh, performance that he introduced um, was originally, it was introduced around 1916. It was originally called A Lesson in Harmony, um, but it later became known as The Singing Lesson. And Ellen, if you can go in here, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this marionette. So first it's on loan um, from the Dallas Puppet Theater and Pick Smith, and it came from the Gary and Carmen Bus Collection. And this marionette is of Professor Herkimer, um, and he was a piano player in the what we call the the singing lesson, and he would be in his parlor and giving a singing lesson to this woman, and the marionette was able to lift the uh, lid of the grand piano, he turned the pages of his music, and he would spin around on his stool. Um, so this became a very popular act and ended up kind of bridging. It was his salons that would then allow him kind of to um, have an opportunity to perform uh, professionally. Great. Thank you so much, Darren. Well, uh, we are wondering if anybody has questions right now, we'd be more than happy to take them. One thing that I'd like to mention um, is that you may have noticed these fantastical case fronts uh, that are on some of our displays. These were actually designed by Carl Sprague, who's going to be speaking tomorrow on a panel that Darren will chair. And Carl is uh, an illustrator, designer, puppeteer himself, but also um, the designer for the Wes Anderson movies. And uh, he's worked closely with Wes Anderson and in many other theatrical productions as well. So they've been a great addition to our installation. Great. Ever meet? Oh, this is a great question. Um, and it's a great question because we've been trying to figure that out and we have no actual evidence of ha their having met. However, uh, they were certainly contemporaries. They belonged to the same clubs in New York City. So they belonged to the Society of Illustrators. They belonged to the Salma Gundy Club. They belonged to the Dutch Treat Club. And it is highly likely that they would have, um, you know, certainly bumped into each other. But we are fairly certain that they would have been aware of each other's work. So I mean, good question. Some of an age difference, but in the circles they traveled, I think it, it's not necessarily a, a problem. Right. Does Sarg have any formal training? No. As far as we know, he did not have any formal training. Um, I think his training was really his uh, personal um determination 
to be an artist, to continue to draw uh, and to be observant. And those were really the hallmarks of his work. But he himself became an educator in many ways. And I think Darren's going to talk a little bit about that later. Well, and we also know from his youth that he was doing things. He was a problem solver. So he would investigate and figure out how to do things on his own. So whether that was illustrating or puppeteering, he went out and figured it out. Yeah, there's a wonderful story about him uh, actually in Guatemala at the age of six. Uh, his father gave him the chore of letting the chickens out every morning, very early in the morning. So uh, he famously constructed a device that was a pulley that would allow him from his bedroom window to open the door and allow the chickens out. So I think that sense of problem solving is definitely evident from an early age. Great. Mm -hmm. It references the universal art. Well, basically, it's a stereograph. Do you want to say what a stereograph was? Oh, I, yeah, oh, you don't? Okay. You. <laughs> well, a stereograph, you know, um, when we think about um, the way things were uh, many years ago, there were different kinds of entertainments that uh, were practiced. And one of them was a, this kind of a stereograph that would basically function on the concept of binocular vision, this concept that one eye, uh, our left eye sees slightly different from our right eye, so that if you place two images into a device that will allow you to meld your vision, you will have almost a three-dimensional sensation when looking at them. So when people put that photographic image into the stereograph, they would actually see just one image, but it would look somewhat dimensional. So that is um, th that was a company that produced those kinds of photographs. But the curiosity shop is so infamous that there are products going back 200 years that were made to market the curiosity shop. So if you go on eBay, you can find things like curiosity shop dishes and Christmas houses and ink wells and calendars and and art prints. So it's been over the you know more than a century or two. It's been a tourist attraction. Mm -hmm. Great. One last question. Okay, great. Yeah. Of course. What happened to Mary, mm -hmm. and she had children. Right. So, great question. Um, the question was, what happened to Tony's daughter, Mary? So, I'll just mention um, Tony Sarg married um, Bertha McGowan in 1909, when Sarg was a German soldier, and she was a tourist in Germany, and they kept a long distance relationship for about three years, and then married. Um, in Cincinnati, Ohio, which was actually his first trip to the United States. So uh, Mary was born about two years later. She was born in 1911. And um, she became an artist. Uh, we have a painting by Mary in the, in the exhibition, which we'll show you in a little bit. Uh, but she was also a great um, champion of her father's. She actually completed some of his projects after he passed away and helped to run his own kind of curiosity shops, his own toy shops, uh, which were on Nantucket, Marblehead, Massachusetts, uh, and New Hope, Pennsylvania, and New York City as well. So she became a kind of a partner in his business later on in life. Great, good questions. So we're gonna go over to the next gallery, um, but what I'll share is, um, I talked about uh, Sarg salons in New York, and those salons opened the window for him to start uh, presenting and producing professional uh, puppet productions in New York. And tomorrow on our 10 o'clock panel on Sarg and puppetry, we're going to get into details about those productions. But um, his second Broadway 
uh, show I want to talk about here. And if we can just go up and look at this uh, program, um, the second show that Tony Sarg did on Broadway was The uh, Rose in the Ring. And um, this is important for two reasons. One, he collaborated with Ellen von Volkenberg uh, from Chicago's Little Theater in presenting the show. She was the artistic director and she really um, brought a sense of theater. So up till this, up till him um, going from salons to professional theater, it had been little shorts and skits with trick, uh, trick marionettes. And she really um, encouraged Tony to think about um, his marionette productions as plays um, with stories that had a beginning, middle, and end. Um, Ellen von Volkenberg also really instilled in Sarg um, the importance of training your puppeteers, um, just like you would train an actor, um, and also how to direct puppetry. So very influential. Second reason The Rose in the Ring is important, this is the very last production that Tony Sarg would actually serve as puppeteer. So because he had all of these business ventures happening, um, he had very little time to actually roll up his sleeves and, and get on the marionette bridge. Um, so after The Rose in the Ring, Sarg would really serve in more of an artistic director role for the productions um, that he would um, carry on with. So in 19, because of the success that he had on Broadway, in 1920, he decided to form uh, the Tony Sarg Marionettes. And this was a traveling company of eight to nine puppeteers and crew that would literally visit 150 cities each year and perform 400 shows. It was a grueling uh, tour schedule. Um, we are fortunate today um, to have probably the largest collection of original Tony Sarg marionettes um, that have been on display for the public. And um, you can, we'll start talking about these behind me. Um, these are on loan from the Northwest Puppet Center and were part of the, um, the, the Cook um, marionette collection. And so I wanna talk a little bit and just kind of go through what you're seeing here. Um, so the first um, character is the Sultan from the 1932 production of Arabian um, to, to his right is The Carpenter and the Walrus, um, which were featured in the 1930 and 31 uh, production of Alice in Wonderland. And then next to them is King Arthur. Um, and this was a character in a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, uh, which was toured in 1935. And next to him is another very early uh, Sarg piece, um, likely 1920. We don't know the character, but this was in uh, Rip Van Winkle. And then if we move down here, um, and this is pretty pretty stunning, is this is a cast of characters um, from Sarg 39 production of Robin Hood. And this would be the final um, production that was presented by the Tony Sarg marionettes, because unfortunately, this was when Tony Sarg was um, experiencing some financial troubles. And in fact, um, we've heard stories that the um, tour had to stop midway and that the puppets were actually given to puppeteers uh, to compensate them because Sarg unfortunately couldn't pay, um, pay them uh, cash. Um, but this is just incredible to see these. And we're going to talk more about how they were built in their construction tomorrow. But one thing I do want to just share is if you can close up and look at the hands, you can always tell a Tony Sarg marionette the detail in the hands, and they would always have kind of cupped um, hand position where the thumbs out and the and the rest of the four fingers are kind of uh, together. So it's really um, interesting to see the see these together. So Stephanie. Thank you, Darren. Um, one thing I'll just mention is though Sarg was a remarkable puppeteer uh, and puppet builder, uh, he often thought of himself as an illustrator first. And um, I just want to point out that he illustrated many of his own, or I should say all of his own uh, posters, marketing posters, um, so such as the one that you see here for Faust the Wicked Magician from 1934, which displays the fact that this was a particularly wonderful production because it had a lot of 
uh, visual effects, including smoke and water. Um, and then, of course, he would use those illustrations or sometimes different ones to place on the covers of his programs. And um, you'll notice in the case that there are programs for Faust. Uh, there are actually programs for Rip Van Winkle. Uh, and these are all Sarg drawings. So it's a, a wonderful aspect of uh, his versatility. And Sarg also, um, probably most important for Sarg in terms of puppetry was his commitment to sharing his craft. So again, tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit about this, but um, when Sarg decided he wanted to feature uh, puppetry and marionettes in his salons, he went out and asked a very prominent um, London uh, marionette company, the Holden Marionettes, if they would kind of help him and teach him the trade, and they refused. And I think that really, um, Sarg held that with him um, because he was turned away. And so throughout his entire career, Tony Sarg made um, a priority to educate young people and even adults about the craft of puppetry, encouraging people to get involved in, in the trade of craft. And so if you look down here, um, in 1920, Tony Sarg published the Tony Sarg Marionette book. And this was America's first kind of go-to, how-to book on building marionettes as well as marionette theater. It became the go-to for every aspiring puppeteer in the country. Um, he also published a series of articles, Popular Mechanics, Scouting, Ladies Home Journal, um, all about marionette construction and building and performing with marionettes. He also, um, each summer uh, for a time, hosted a summer workshop, uh, a summer course on marion building and performing marionettes. Um, his workshop was at 54 West 9th Street in Manhattan in Greenwich Village, and, and the building is still there. Um, but he would have people come and they would spend a number of weeks uh, learning the craft and they'd get a diploma. Um, so this just really, again, emphasizes the importance that he had on passing the craft and creating a new legacy for puppeteers. So we're going to talk a lot tomorrow about the people that he influenced, but we thought tonight we'd spend time on one person, and that is Bill Baird. And Bill Baird, um, when he was in high school, saw a production of Rip Van Winkle at his high school in Iowa, and it changed him. And he then went to college, and when he got out of college, he got a job with Tony Sarg. And he not only puppeteered, but he actually did building and designing for Sarg. And um, the Ballard Institute and Museum for Puppetry has graciously loaned us a number of uh, Bill Baird uh, puppets that I want to talk about here. Um, so the first one, if we go down here to the left, um, is the goats and a donkey from Jerry Pulls the Strings. And this was produced in 1934, and it's considered to be the first full-length commercial work using puppetry. And I think a lot of you will see the two uh, goats look familiar. And that's because uh, Bill Baird used a similar look when he designed the puppets and the goats in the Lonely Goatard scene in the 1965 motion picture, The Sound of Music. Um, next to the goats is the Egyptian king from The King Who Came to Breakfast. And this was a 1948 film about the history of wheat. Um, Nabisco commissioned Bill Baird um, to make this. And he not only designed and build, uh, built the marionettes for, for this film, but he also wrote and directed uh, the film. And then uh, next over is a fireman marionette that was featured in the 1946 Broadway production of Nellie Bly. And uh, Bill Baird had a number of um, marionettes in different Broadway shows over the years. Um, there's another um, uh, puppeteer that was actually also influenced um, by Sarg um, that Lenore's going to talk about here. Thank you, Darren. Uh, one of the uh, earliest things that I had researched in, in Washington, D.C., where I live, is uh, the in the Archives of American Art 
they were holding materials about Tony Sarg, some of his, uh, some of it was on microfilm, but some originals, but they, uh, they had a, a wonderful collection of uh, books and um, pamphlets that Tony Sarg had students who worked with him. And this one student who was extremely well known now is Alma Thomas, who was an African American painter and educator from Washington, DC. And her life was really an amazing story. And she wanted to create not only uh, a theatrical en environments for her students, educating them, but that's why she took Tony Sarg's workshop uh, in the 1930s and was able to uh, create very similar but a little more abstract puppets that were that she designed and she was also into uh, fashion design and created wonderful clothing that was well known uh, and distinctive for the puppetry that she did. Uh, currently there's an exhibition at the uh, Muse American Art Museum, Smithsonian American Art Museum that highlights her paintings. And I was fortunate to have had a painting of uh, Alma Thomas's in the collection for the George Washington University, and which traveled with the, uh, uh, with the exhibition that was held at the Phillips Collection. And the Phillips Collection in Washington actually had several of her uh, puppets on display. Thank you. Thank you, Lenore. So I'd like to spend um, just a few minutes talking a little bit about Tony Sarg's work as a book illustrator, uh, because uh, this was something that um, he was quite prolific at, having produced probably at least 25 illustrated books uh, during the course of his career, many of which were branded with his name. And it was a way that he began to, uh, you know, just ensure that his name was out there just as his troupe was called Tony Sarg's Marionettes. Uh, we had Tony Sarg's Alphabet Book, uh, Tony Sarg's Book of Surprises. Uh, but in this case, this really beautiful series, this amazing series, uh, comes to us from the Nantucket Historical Association. These are individual pages, both finished and in dummy form for his 1924 book called Tony Sarg's Book for Children, uh, ages six to 60. And this concept of ages six to 60 is something that he uh, repeated over and over again in relation to many projects. I think his idea was to have something for everyone. But this one is a series of stories that starts out with a story, um, which Ellen is going to hone in on right here, um, focusing on his time in Nantucket Island. In 1921, he began summering on the island, and it was just kind of becoming a burgeoning art community at that time. But I'll just show you, I'm just going to read you this page because it's this kind of this perfect um, picture puzzle that he that, uh, 40 miles out at sea, not so far from Boston, there was a lovely island named Nantucket. And it goes on to say the little island was full of quaint old New England homes, and you can actually see some of the home designs there. The people who owned the houses used to go out whale fishing. There's the whaling boat, of course, and the whale. And they made so much money selling whale oil which you also see there in barrels, that they had nice red bricks specifically brought from England. Now, one summer day, there arrived on the island a pretty little girl with red bobbed hair. And of course, there he refers to his daughter, Mary, who appears um, throughout the book. And um, to give you a sense of uh, some of the depictions of Mary, we see her here um, riding her horse, and of course, always accompanied by the family dog Freckles, which was actually their dog. So, um, you know, just to show you the difference, the, the piece on top is actually a dummy page. So there you can see some of Sarg's sketches, but you'll also see that there's a patch of text that's pasted in. He's crossed out some of it. Uh, and this is really where he is working out his ideas. Um, and then of course you come down to beautiful pages like this, where you know, we see that he's perfectly integrated the illustrations and the text. 
And on top, we see Mary with freckles. And of course, Mr. and Mrs. Sarg kind of settling in around the fire of the home that they purchased on Nantucket, um, which as Sarg said, they uh, furnished with antiques from different periods. So I'll take you around this way um, and show you the actual printed book in our case. So we are fortunate to have um, a beautiful edition of Tony Sark's book for children there in uh, on its stand. And uh, so you can see how that translated into the published piece. But Sark was always thinking about book ideas. Um, the piece on the left here is a book dummy for something that Sarg was working on called Tony Sarg's Little Treasure Book. Uh, I'm sorry, Little Theater Book. And it's hard to see it, but on the left-hand side, you'll notice that there is actually a stage proscenium that's cut out. And there would have been the concept of having uh, little stick pu puppets that uh, people could have played with through that proscenium. And one book that uh, Sarg did not live to see published, but that his daughter Mary uh, made sure to produce was Tony Sarg's treasure book. And in that book, he had uh, abbreviated stories based on classic tales like Rip Van Winkle, Alice in Wonderland, and Treasure Island. And you can see this, it's a very interactive book. It's got die cuts. Uh, it has places where people can insert uh, small puppets. Um, and so uh, his idea was that he wanted his readers to be engaged uh, and to be involved with his work. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Lenore because Sark also created a number of important books uh, of fiction. Uh, so he was also illustrating fiction for adults, including the book that you see here, um, which is called The Martial Adventures of Henry and Me by the author William Allen White. Thank, Thank you, you, Stephanie. So uh, there are a, a couple of books that we know of that uh, Tony Sarg did that related to the political and uh, global situation of the times. And I, this section actually is celebrated, calling, we're calling it humor fantasy and the turning page. Of course, the turning page is so important for the uh, symposium that we're working on uh, for today and tomorrow. And these, uh, we have the book here, and the, these are some of the original illustrations for the book itself. And the, the story is rather charming because it, it uh, follows the tale of two Midwesterners who uh, go to the front in uh, Europe and are uh, treated as, as, as journalists. I mean, they are recording what they see and hear, but a lot of the story itself involves their uh, sort of eavesdropping on the, the uh, budding roman romance of a young woman on the cruise ship that they uh, went over on to, to Europe. And uh, so some of these uh, story, uh, part, illustrations have a comedic turn uh, to them. And one of my favorite ones is the uh, one where the he's holding up his uh, his uh, pants because he he went to a, a tailor to get the uniform and it was too large and he was struggling to keep on his uniform. So uh, this is a rather intriguing series. And uh, also he did some illustrations for a book uh, about uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt meets uh, Ben Franklin. So th there were uh, but very timely illustrations that he was able to do. Then turning to this wall, we have two um, major works of art by uh, Tony Sarg that were uh, borrowed from the Library of Congress. And they illustrate uh, a very prominent humorist of the day named Irvin S. Cobb. And apparently, uh, Tony Sarg did not know him uh, personally. Didn't like he didn't sit for him, but he was working from photographs. But nevertheless, he captured this rather uh, portly individual who was in always getting into different unusual situations. 
uh, one book that he had illustrated for him was uh, uh, Speaking of Operations, which is a really interesting story and rather humorous. And over here, we have another image of Irvin S. Cobb of Kentucky. And here we find that he is uh, represented as a Davy Crockett-like individual character. And there are certain symbols here. Of course, he's smoking a cigar. It, it's, it's, almost, it's quite a caricature. But the, the one thing is in, uh, that I noticed in this is he used a, um, a device to show a, a figure that resembles either a dinosaur or a camel, but it, it's in the shape of the state of Kentucky. So throughout his drawings, he would insert little clues or iconography of what the image was really about, as well as the interesting lettering and uh, the, the design itself. Thank you. Thank you, Lenore. I'll just mention that um, the drawings on the wall that Lenore was pointing out um, are actually from the Mariana Kistler Beach Museum at Kansas State University. And tomorrow, Catherine Slogic, their director of education, is going to be talking about these drawings in particular because she is the granddaughter of William Allen White. So that'll be an interesting conversation. Does anybody have any questions they might like to share or comments? So the question is, were, the, were his marionette shows accessible to the general public? Yeah, so the great thing about the Tony Sarg marionette company when it began touring in 1921 is it toured all across the country and was playing at very accessible places. So they were in local theaters, gymnasiums, libraries. Um, so that, yes, the general public got to see lots of Tony Sarg, and that was really the first time they had seen these types of elaborate productions that, again, had stories. And, you know, what's interesting about Sarg, because he was an illustrator and a designer, he paid so much attention to the sets and the props and the detail of the marionette design. And so these were shows that people in small towns and even cities had never seen across the country. Um, so yes, they did have access. Including Bill Baird. Yes. So apparently when Bill Baird was 11 years old. Well, in high school, he was in high school. He was high school and he saw a production of Rip Van Winkle. Um, Harry Burnett of the Yale Puppeteers also saw, uh, saw a Tony Sarg production and that inspired him to, to get into puppetry. So um, the impact of those productions over the years of the company um, can't even be measured. And I do just want to mention, um, in addition to the amazing uh, marionettes that were loaned to us um, from the um, Cook Marx collection and the Northwest uh, Puppetry Center, we have two additional original Tony Sarg marionettes um, that were loaned to us um, from the puppeteer, uh, Philip Huber. So I want to thank Philip for also uh, loaning those to us. Great, thank you. Other questions? Do you have any video documentation of the early puppeteer? There is a little bit. Would you uh, like to say something? Yeah, about there's a, the, the footage that I've seen, I believe it's from A Night in Delhi. Yes. Um, and it's just a very short video. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of video of his marionette productions. Um, there's photographs. In fact, there's a, a large collection of uh, photography at the um, Nantucket Historical Association that's actually available online. So if you go to their website and look in their archives, um, there's hundreds of photos that you can see from his shows. The other thing to look for is, um, and we do have some on view, in the, 19, the early 1920s, Sarg was a very early animator. He was experimenting with a shadow puppet technique in which he would uh, basically do a stop motion animation. And, um, you know, he produced, I think, something like 26 uh, shadow puppet productions, or I should say animated productions, with uh, William Dawley who was an early animator as well. So those are really interesting to look for. And when we have to believe, I mean, these are pre-Disney. Yes, they are. So this 
we definitely have to believe that Tony Sarg had an enormous influence mm -hmm. on Disney and, and his, the creative um, avenues that he took. Great. And looks like we have another question. Great. Good questions, everybody. You want to take that one? Or? I, I repeat the question. Oh, I would repeat like the question. Thanks. Did uh, Tony Sark have a preferred uh, medium? You mean an a uh, uh, graphic medium that he worked with in um, drawing? I would say that his ability, he, he liked line drawing, and then some of his drawings were executed perhaps in charcoal. But uh, we're talking about what was available, a lot of the things that he did, we only see in black and white, so we don't get a full idea of the, the colorful nature of some of, let's say, his um, puppetry uh, in theater or presentations. But w I would have to say that he was a um, a brilliant draftsman, and uh, his characterization of of people and motion was very important to his creative style. And that's what he was attempting to capture in the fluid line drawings, and then that he uh, did for his books and other things. Although I would say that uh, you can actually see some of the drawings have. Um, certain illustrational concepts like Benday dots, which were used to show shading and uh, contour in early in black and white illustration. He also actually stated that he was not an oil painter. And so that is a distinction between Sarg and Rockwell. And in images like these, um, you know, for example, his book illustrations, uh, watercolor and gouache would have been used. So gouache being a, an opaque watercolor, it had a lot of advantages. It dried quickly. Uh, it could be covered over if he wasn't happy with something. Uh, so I think that, um, as Lenore said, the line aspect was very strong in his work. And um, then for color, often additions of watercolor and gouache. One last question. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit more about his cinematic work? Ooh. Do you want to take that? Because I actually don't know a lot about his cinematic work. Well, I think the animation. Yeah. Well, I think um, interestingly, the shorts that he produced, the animated shorts, would have been shown as like precursors to films in, in major theaters. So, uh, you know, it would have been maybe you would come to the theater and you might see an animation short and then you might see a news clip and then you might get to the main feature. But, you know, this concept of um, this cinematography, I think, is definitely part of Sarg's work when you think about his, you know, that amazing ability to draw uh, from a bird's eye perspective or you know, to see across many pages of a book in terms of thinking about how movement and time would progress. Um, those are all aspects of, in a way, cinematography uh, and the way a filmmaker might think about doing something. And Stephanie, I'd also just share is that in the animation that he was doing, he was actually using um, shadow puppetry mm -hmm. in a lot of that. So it was a combination of film and puppetry, um, and it was just the the stop motion was the way that they were actually capturing the images as they were moving through using that shadow puppetry. Uh, thanks. We we saw uh, had some evidence at the um, in the archives of the Nash, uh, Nantucket Historical Association of a, a precursor to some kind of a uh, cinema that he was thinking of doing, but we don't think it was actually accomplished. But it was around the same time that I think Disney was coming up with the more uh, sophisticated uh, approach to animation and certainly more in color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next gallery. Good. Okay. Well, we are going to move forward to our last gallery and to some of uh, Sarg's commercial whimsy or commercial projects.
So I think we'll start our discussion by talking about um, Tony Sarg's shops. He actually um, had several stores which contained uh, many objects that he actually designed. And um, we have this wonderful artifact here. Um, this is a Tony Sarg shop uh, from um, New Hope, Pennsylvania, where he had uh, a toy shop for children. And you can see that um, this is actually the interior of one of his stores where you know there would be shelves just full of all kinds of toys and um, handmade boxes and um, you know other objects which we'll share with you in the gallery here. But um, Sark actually in, in uh, spending his summers on Nantucket um, worked with his wife Bertha to open stores. And one of them is actually seen here. Um, this is a store that uh, Sarg kept on um, the wharf in Nantucket. And on the bottom, a drawing that he created of a second shop from around 1940. Uh, and you can see that his drawing is very fanciful and welcoming. Um, but as we move around the corner here, you're going to see some of the elements of the objects that he created. So he would create um, designs that were decorative for coasters, for example. And um, for some reason, he had a real interest in Pennsylvania Dutch design, repetitive design. Um, and he also created panels, decorative panels, that uh, would actually be applied to band boxes. So these are storage boxes that were very popular in his shops. They would have been lithographed. Uh, they would have been pasted onto the boxes. And this was a way that Sarg used repetitive design to create uh, an ongoing supply of some of the products that were sold in his stores. And they were colorful, generally um, lighthearted, and um, you know, full of visual storytelling. And though we didn't find much information about his shop on Front Street in Marblehead, Massachusetts, we were able to borrow from uh, the Nantucket Historical Association a poster advertising his shop. And there you'll see that moniker again from six to 60, which is something that he loved to repeat. Um, he designed for all kinds of products. Um, so here, Ellen is going to share an illustrated shower curtain design that uh, you know definitely has uh, kind of nautical elements. And underneath that, um, a series of playing cards that Sarg would have sold in his shops. And on the bottom, a um, group of great linen cocktail napkins that um, are from a wonderful private collection on Nantucket uh, that we have been very fortunate to borrow from. And we thank uh, Max and Pamela Berry for that uh, wonderful donation for our show. As we come down this way, you'll get a sense of some of the additional commercial whimsy uh, that Sarg enjoyed creating for. Uh, this is a series of um, illustrated fabrics. They are uh, fabrics on silk that were created um, in about 1925. Um, I'm sorry, about 19, between 1927 and 1935. So there was a circus theme and on the bottom, a jack-in-the-box theme. And, and these would have been booklets that um, are essentially samples that would have been shown to uh, purchasers of these fabrics. And uh, here, a wonderful apron that Sarg designed for the Jungle Bar uh, at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in the 1930s. Uh, one of his 
favorite themes were animated animals. Animals were something that he just absolutely loved to draw, but of course, not in a serious way, in a more anthropomorphized way. So here you see a pink elephant actually making or shaking um, a cocktail and serving it to his friends, um, you know, a monkey, a crocodile, uh, a bear, who all appear to be having a wonderful time. So Sartre was actually involved in design for the Waldorf Astoria when it moved from its old location into its current location. Um, and Lenore will say a little bit more about that. And then, of course, there are these fantastic, fanciful wallpapers. And you can imagine um, in the 1930s during the Great Depression that these <clears throat> would have added um, a tremendous amount of lightness to various rooms. But one on top is actually uh, created from uh, the story of Alice in Wonderland. So you're seeing you know, many of the major characters there, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and uh, the Mad Hatter, of course, and Alice and the White Rabbit. Um, so his designs were really across media. And to give you a sense of how famous Sarg was, if we come here, um, I'll show you some of the advertisements in which he actually endorsed products. So for example, we see Sarg's face here uh, in an advertisement called Tony Sarg in Whiskerland for Gillette. So not only do we see his face, but we see that he's illustrated a cartoon uh, about you know all the benefits of, of a clean shave. And next to it, um, an advertisement using the same image of Sark, by the way, for Goodrich safety tires. Um, so like Rockwell, Sark did quite a bit of advertising and like Rockwell, um, he as an artist was used to endorse a very wide range of products, which basically says that um, if Tony Sark says, this is a good product, it probably is. And here we see Sarg on top um, doing an advertisement or actually taking a test um, for which he uh, earned only 80% in the Shenley exam. And that's for Shenley's light whiskers, whiskies. Another wonderful group of commercial products yes. that Sarg created are in this case. And so I'm more giving you a little background. I was uh, fascinated to learn that he also did porcelain uh, ceramic pieces and decorated them very much in the style of more art, art deco period style, whereas much of his design seems more rooted in the 19th century. I think there was a big attempt here to create these powder boxes. You see five examples here. And, and what that was is the you put the powder uh, inside and then there was a puff so it was something you would put on your boudoir at, in that time period uh, they were produced by the Fulper uh, factory which is located in New Jersey and Fulper eventually became the Stangle pottery in uh, New Jersey and he also worked with another company for the, the creation of this uh, vase, which repeats the theme of the uh, Nantucket um, uh, uh, carry, uh, cart. And in there you can see uh, and that was produced by a different company of the, in New York, the uh, Inwood Pottery, which is no longer in existence, but it was a very uh, well-known pottery at the time. And then there were also souvenir, uh, smaller objects that he created for his, probably sold in his shop. So thank you. Thanks, Lenore. Okay. <clears throat> we're just gonna show you a few examples of the band boxes I was mentioning a little bit earlier. These would have been wooden boxes that uh, essentially would be assembled by a small team of individuals who lived locally, for example, in, in Nantucket. And then those strips of um, lithographed designs would be pasted on top of the boxes and on the sides in various scales. 
Um, and then, of course, it would be shellac because the shellac gave the object a sense of being very painterly. Um, in his shops, he also sold wonderful things like small letter boxes um, that you see here with scenes uh, that would have been local. So Nantucket lighthouses were very popular. And even things like uh, mailing tubes, um, which would have decorative elements on them. But one of my favorite things, I must say, um, are his lighthearted letters to his daughter, Mary. And here you see that he's drawn this wonderful illustration on, on one of his, uh, his letterheads, his Tony Sarg's marionettes letterheads. And the illustrated envelopes are really terrific because um, not only do they have fantastic drawings, but basically uh, this one, for example, on top, is literally addressed uh, to Nantucket and to Mary. And that's about it. And it got there. So um, it's a wonderful remnant of another time. Darren, would you like to talk about big, oh, oh I'm sorry, we're moving over to another commercial project. I apologize to our Madam Alexander uh, Theater. Well, thank you, Stephanie. We're pretty fortunate to find a collector who was uh, majorly interested in Madame Alexander's uh, dolls products. So not only did he collect the uh, Madame Alexander dolls, which now, uh, by the way, is their, the company is celebrating their 100th year anniversary. They're still in existence in New York. And uh, this is an example of a theater that one would have be able to buy, take home, and assemble because it's made out of cardboard and printed. And it's amazing that actually it survived this long because this again was an encouragement for children to participate in uh, uh, storytelling, showing uh, puppet plays, and doing this uh, before, obviously, before television became so ascendant and uh, for their attention. And I find it is really interesting the way it's just simply put together. But uh, this was a company, uh, the Alexander Dahl Company, was founded in 1923, as I said, uh, by Beatrice Alexander. And uh, the, the marionettes that uh, Sarg produced for their company were very successful. They were shown all over uh, various um, department stores in New York and certainly in Macy's. And once you could see a whole array of them and they're smaller than his normal, his actual puppets. And that's because they were meant to be more easily manipulated by children. Now, if you come around the other side, this is a very rare collection of Ma uh, marionette plays and of the Walt, D Walt Disney characters. So it, it, for uh, Snow White and the Seven uh, Dwarfs, and we see there seem to be a very fresh looking and there, this is a more recent uh, portrayal but the marionette theater, again, was provided with the uh, plays and with, uh, again, you see Disney is ascending at this point in the 30s. So he sort of took over the design of puppets from uh, Tony Sarg's company. So these puppets are somewhat accessible. You can find them today. and uh, But this is a rather beautiful set of those. And we're grateful to uh, Mr. Rodney Wall uh, Waller from Texas for making these possible. Great. And just a fun little story about the um, Madame Alexander, Tony Sard marionettes. Um, first, it's interesting because the he designed 33 different types of marionettes, composite marionettes that were sold in department stores, not only in New York, but all over the country. But they were had a European style because they had a, a metal rod from their head, which is very reminiscent of the Sicilian uh, marionette that Lenore showed us earlier. Um, but a fun COVID story happened to me. I was um, perusing through Facebook Marketplace over uh, during the COVID epidemic and scrolled and scrolled and scrolled and 
all of a sudden this marionette theater popped up and it was very tall and it had red velvet curtains and a woman from Maine was selling it. And I zoomed in and embroidered in the uh, proscenium curtain, it said Tony Sarg. And so I instantly contacted um, the seller and um, we got in the car and drove up during the pandemic to, to Maine and purchased it. And what was interesting, because we got the backstory on it and we found out that this woman's grandfather, or it may have been her great grandfather, owned a department store in Dallas, Texas. And so what we now know is that Tony Sarg's shop, workshop, um, built maybe six, 12 of these that came in three foot by three foot by one foot deep boxes and the boxes unhinge and it becomes the stage and all of the pieces of the marionette theater are inside. And so they sent these out to department stores so folks in the toy department could demonstrate the marionettes as a marketing tool um, to sell. So I have this marionette theater. Unfortunately, it was too big to put up in here. But what's interesting is with that marionette theater, there were eight hand-painted backdrops that were done by Tony's um, shop, um, which is quite rare. Um, so now, if you want to follow me, um, so 1933 was really the pinnacle of Tony Sarg's career. And because of that, um, when they were planning the uh, World's Fair World Exposition in Chicago, um, he was tapped on many fronts. Um, first, they had him design this incredible map of the Century of Progress uh, campus on the Lake Michigan waterfront. And what's interesting about this, if you go to the top right here, you know, Sarg really started incorporating in this map his storytelling. So there's this great piece in the corner that talks about a beam of light was captured from the 1893 World's Fair and was captured by this telescope at this observatory and they brought it and shined it down to shine a spotlight on the century of progress. I think what's also really interesting about this map, it's so much bolder in color than a lot of his previous work. And if you look here, what's great is some of the um, buildings in this from the century of progress still exist. So the Field Museum, Soldier Field, where the bears play, and the um, Adler Planetarium still exists there. And then if you kind of scroll across, um, you'll see this area that was called the Enchanted Island. And this was the um, part of the fair that was specifically focused at children and families. And if you move over here and you get to about right here, this is the A&P Carnival. So the, Tony Sark had many puppet productions at the Chicago World's Fair all over. But his largest one was the AMP Carnival. And this was a 3,000 seat amphitheater on the water. And if you um, come over here, we actually have a postcard that shows the details. It had a revolving stage. So there was a 25 minute review and the review featured different puppeteers. So Bill Baird, um, Rufus and Margot Rose, who um, met as puppeteers when they worked for Sarg and actually ended up getting married and went off and had a very successful career as puppeteers. They performed as part of the review. Um, the Century of Progress was a huge success for Sarg, and um, they think about 3 million people um, saw his productions at, the, at that exposition. Sarg would later go on to say it was 10 million, which was very Barnum-esque in terms of inflating the number of people. So 1933, and then let's jump to 1939 and the New York World's Fair. And we don't have a lot of detail on what happened in those six years, but Sarg, um, his financial um, situation became precarious and he was not in good times and was really struggling. Because of that, um, Sarg did not have puppeteers or the Sarg marionettes perform at the New York World's Fair. Uh, New York World's Fair. This is the cover. He was tapped to design the, the map for the fair. And what's interesting is just in those six years, the footprint of a World's Fair grew exponentially. And so instead of a single map, 
this brochure included, I think about six or eight fold out maps of different areas of the fair that people could go to in New York. And um, up here is one of the pullout maps um, from the New York World's Fair. I also wanna point out, um, so in addition to the map, he had decided that he was gonna sell merchandise at the New York World's Fair as a way to kind of have a financial turnaround. Um, and um, before we leave the maps, I want to point out here, in 33, he had done this kind of funny piece on, on the map that talked about exhibition feet, right? Well, he revisits that theme um, for the New York World's Fair. If you pull out here, we'll show you. Um, he had created this kind of finger puppet card um, that also talked about exposition feet. So in those the years between, he hadn't forgotten about that. Um, above that card is a is a map of the fair, and it's a cane that he designed. So it's a spring-loaded cane that has a pull-out map of the World's Fair. So he had invested a lot of his own resources in creating merchandise to sell and sell at the fair, and unfortunately, it wasn't as successful as he was hoping. And because of that, in in 1939, he declared bankruptcy, and then things kind of fell and that's why the Tony Sard marionettes then uh, dissolved um, in that next year. And so Stephanie, I think you're going to talk a little bit about his time in Nantucket. Yes. Well, you're going to get a, a wonderful overview of his time in Nantucket tomorrow from curator Michael Harrison and from George Korn, but I'll just show a few things that are in the exhibition, including this wonderful door. As I mentioned, Sarg um, had a great love of Nantucket uh, he lived most of the year in New York City, but um, 1921, he began to summer on the island. And this is a fantastic painting uh, from a men's room door in a restaurant called The Skipper. And of course, in humorous style, um, the lobster and the fish that the fisherman has caught are just about the same size as he is. And uh, I'm sure it, it brought a lot of joy to uh, the people who encounter that in real life. Um, there are some great artifacts uh, on the walls. Uh, we have a great photograph of Sarg's own home, which is still there on the island, privately owned. Uh, a picture of Sarg sketching out in a field. And um, a wonderful drawing that he did of a local man uh, who was actually a blind accordion player who uh, Sarg captured you know, in a very sensitive way. But um, someone asked before about Mary Sarg, and I'd like to bring you down here to show, uh, to show you one of Mary's paintings. Um, she was a very accomplished artist, and um, this is a Nantucket scene um, in which we see people enjoying time out on the porch. And of course, um, not so different from her father, there's a wonderful dog, um, which, accompanies the group. Uh, and Mary did go on, as I mentioned, to uh, assist Sarg in his shops and to actually run the um, New Hope shop after Sarg passed away in 1942. But perhaps the most uh, exciting event on Nantucket was the 1937 Sea Monster hoax. And this was actually, um, well, you can see how Sarg here looking as, as pleased as Punch that he has actually pulled it off. But in order to um, bring attention to the island and also attention to his shops, he actually created a sea monster, um, working with the local papers to create suspense. So if we come to uh, these photographs, you'll notice that um, these are actual photographs from the period in which uh, Mary Sarg assisted making uh, large, mysterious footprints in the sand. And then, of course, two local fishermen discover them, uh, as does the local paper. And uh, Sarg actually created um, the balloon in different parts. One, of, one was a head that was floated across the harbor and then finally assembled um, on August 18th, 1937. Uh, to the delight of all. So it must have been quite a spectacle. And as we think about balloons, 
Uh, of course, the balloons that Sark is most famous for are the Macy's Thanksgiving Day. So in 1924, that was the year that Macy's expanded and took over the whole block on 34th Street. Um, and to mark that of becoming the world's largest department store, um, Macy, R.H. Macy, decided to have a Christmas parade. And to promote the Christmas parade, he called uh, Sarg. We think they might have met um, on Nantucket because they both spent time there. But he called Sarg and asked him if he would design um, some holiday windows. And what's important about this is this was the first time that mechanical um, animated windows had been done for the holidays. And they had taken uh, a series of windows along 34th Street and created a 70 foot long tableau that featured 27 scenes from fairy tales and nursery rhymes. And uh, Tony Sarg would continue to design those holiday windows at Macy's until his death in 1942. But it's really Sarg that started the whole trend of department stores doing these kind of fabulous over the top animated windows for, for the holiday season. Um, the parade had started and the feature attraction in the parade was animals from the Bronx Zoo. And after three years, Macy decided that wasn't going so well. It was scaring the children. And so he called Tony Sarg and asked him if he had a big idea for the parade. And he came up with the balloons uh, for the Macy's parade. So the first Sarg balloon um, was in 1927. It was Felix the cat. Um, but the first Felix the cat actually wasn't helium filled and, and held by strings, but it was air filled. Um, it was made, the, the balloon material was made by the Goodyear company and it was held up by sticks. And then for numerous years after that, Sarg would continue uh, to make uh, and design balloons for the parade. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about the details about all that tomorrow, but a couple of pieces I just want to highlight in the exhibition here. Um, up on the top, you will actually see a drawing by Tony Sarg of a, bl a balloon idea. And then just below that is a sketch that was done by Bill Baird. So we know that Bill Baird was helping Tony Sarg on his Macy's projects. And not only did Sarg and Baird design um, balloons, but they were also designing floats and costume characters that would be featured in the parade. And um, over here, I want to just point out, um, we are fortunate to have tomorrow one of our speakers is Lewis Henry Mitchell, who is the lead designer uh, for Sesame Workshop. And in 19, or I'm sorry, in 2003, um, the workshop was tasked with uh, designing a balloon, a Grover balloon for the Macy's uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade. And so these are some of uh, Lewis's original sketches. And Lewis is also a member of the board at the Norman Rockwell Museum, which is awesome. Um, but you're going to hear a lot more tomorrow from the experts on the parade. So we're really excited uh, to talk about that because that the balloon tradition continues. And in just a couple of years, Macy's will be celebrating its 100th anniversary of the parade. Okay, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, just to end Sarg's remarkable story, I'll just mention that um, he died at a fairly young age in 1942 at about 61 years of age. Uh, he had suffered from appendicitis and um, passed away of complications due to that illness. So, um, you know, he had done so much in that amount of time and had such an enormous impact on American popular culture, as you can see. So it's really been a joy to celebrate his accomplishments and to bring uh, the work that he did back into public view. Um, so we're happy to take any final questions if there are any. Yes. yes, our panelists will be talking about that. And um, Christopher Hoskins, actually, who did a book on the history of this uh, amazing um, story, will um, have a lot of background on that. Yeah. And Lenore is holding our wonderful catalog, which actually happens to have one of the balloons on it. Want to, want to talk about that? Well, this one is uh, 
Yes, was it ready? That is name. Right, the red red bird. red bird. And uh, I would like to just say that this is available to uh, acquire in the museum shop here or online. And uh, it it really was a, a terrific experience to work on this uh, catalog. And I think we have pretty much a definitive statement about Tony Tharp's legacy in illustration, design, puppetry, and of course, just being a generous, humorous human being in my estimation. I wish I had met him in person, but I feel that we did his spirit uh, a great service to bring him back into the fold of um, consciousness, at least of American popular culture. And I might well, add, we, well and I might add that we have an actual sea serpent uh, balloon outside of the museum that's terrifically characteristic and follows exactly the uh, course at a one third scale mm -hmm. of the uh, balloon that floated into uh, Nantucket, and that did uh, become a, um, a balloon f subsequently in the Macy's parade. So if you want to see a sea monster in real life, come to visit the Norman Rockwell Museum and you'll find it. <laughs> Thank you. Great. A request from Michelle Menard. Hello, Michelle. Point you there and share the photos of the theater. Oh, absolutely. I'll we'll, I'll give them to Stephanie and maybe we could share them with the participants. Absolutely. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, be happy to. Um, yes, I'm sorry. So the question was, uh, could Darren share the photos of the marionette stage that you purchased? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So we will do that. One last question. Person owns the Tony Sarg New York book, an original. They have no, they don't want to sell it, but is it considered rare and unusual? Um, I could comment on that. Okay. I think. Uh, so, um, you want to repeat the question? Well, the question is there is a, a, a an attendant at the symposium tonight who said they own a uh, Tony Sorg up, New, and, up and down New York book, but an original version of from 1926. I think. So the question is, is it rare? Well, yes, it has some, and it has some important value, but uh, the book has also been reprinted with a uh, foreword and, uh, by Tony Sorg. So one can find uh, the more recent copy very easily, but I would hang on to the uh, original one and or check wonderful. with the rare book dealer. Or check, <laughs> check with uh, a books. Or one more question. Did Sarah work from models and photographs or from memory? Um, As I, I understand it, so the question is, did Sarg work from models or photographs or memory? Um, Sarg was actually an amazing observer of humanity. Human. And as we understand it, he was not reliant on photographs. Um, Rockwell later in his career was uh, an advocate for the use of photography because he was so busy. But um, Sarg really was very spontaneous in his drawing. And as we understand it, his drawing was based on observation. Uh, there is evidence that he would, like a uh, famous photographer, Ouija, would, you know, observe people on the subway, uh, look at their feet and, you know, their gestures and to make note of this because he believed that every little movement portrayed something that 
would be important to view in a, um, a printed material. Or... Well, we thank you all for coming. It has been great to spend the evening with you. Thank you for taking so much time with us. And we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 10 o'clock for a fantastic day of conversations. Uh, so have a great evening and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you again thank for joining you. us. Thank you.